Hey, here we are, Machu Picchu. Once again for a Facebook Live for all of our folks all around the world. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about it. This is really significant all around the world. There's sites that are just not um, being understood appropriately. They are, you know, kind of like uh, putting all of the different cultures together in describing it as one, um, as if, you know, the Incas went around and terraced up to like top of mountains and they moved 40 ton to 60 ton boulder, um, you know, up and down valleys and so on. And there's just clearly a big distinction between the Inca repairs um, that they did to these temple sites that they found, just like the Egyptian repairs that they did to the temple site they found in Egypt. Um, and this is occurring all around the world. And in general, the archaeologic community has been associating, you know, these megalithic construction to the later people that found these uh, sites and repaired them. And it's really a big error. And it's very distinct. It's very easy to make the identification. Yesterday, we were talking to the guides here. And as we start to describe this to the guides very rapidly, they start to realize that, um, you know, they start to get that it was a big distinction between the two cultures. Um, you know, they could see the difference between the cultures that were there that, you know, repaired some of the site and some of the biggest, you know, like the, the big, uh, megalithic stones and the way that they've been arranged together. Now, in the archaeologic community, typically they say, well, there was lower, you know, class citizen that had like less well constructed stuff and then higher classes and that had better constructed stuff. But the thing is, is that, um, you know, the better constructed stuff is so well constructed that even today with all of our technology we can construct it so it doesn't really matter which class uh, they were uh, they were not able to construct something like that um, you know arranging you know 40 ton boulders with perfect precision and you know some of the sites in Machu Picchu for, specifically like the Temple of the Sun is such a good example because you can see these amazingly well arranged stones where you know you couldn't put the hair in between the 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 meetings of the stones but then you can see as well like the stones matched to the bedstone so that there's a combination of terraforming the bedstone and you know the constructions on top of it and it's just so perfect uh, it's incredible and it's nothing we could do today no no way no how you know with all of our technology it's not just the size of the stone it's the precision at which the stones have been arranged and then of course you know there's some size that are like so enormous uh, like uh, you know, a 120 ton stone, like in the middle over there. And, you know, as we saw at uh, Seksik Muaman, uh, you know, the same type of stone, you know, but like very large, 160, 120 ton boulders, all arranged perfectly. So all these things just make it clear the difference between anchor repairs and pre cataclysmic megalithic constructions and it's really time that historians archaeologists start changing the story because the story is vastly different from uh, you know a bunch of Incas pulling on vine ropes uh, and and terraforming a huge portion of their country and and placing incredibly uh, complex uh, uh, sites together with like huge uh, boulder, huge stones. So 
it really, you know, started to, it's, it's time. It's time for the story to change. It's time for us to like recover the true history of the earth. And clearly there was a very advanced civilization that was there most likely pre-cataclysm that is pre 10,000 to 12,000 years ago and uh, that civilization perished and or moved on and you know what we see is the remnants of it that were repaired by the later civilizations all around the world and you know this is very very obvious when you can when you look at the distinction between the qualities of construction and it's really time for us to get a new understanding of the history of humanity this way did you see uh major differences between the way that the construction is here compared to in egypt last year um yeah you can see very a lot of similarities a lot of similarities the way the stones are cut um you know the way they arrange the precisions of the cut um the tool marks you can see everywhere um you know these knobs that are sticking off the stone uh the way the stones are bulging uh you know all this is supportive of the idea that whatever technology it was, it was allowing the stone to become very ionized, um, you know, like maybe in a cold plasma state even when they were being placed so that they could, that they could be shaped exactly so that they could match the way they match like a puzzle uh, and be arranged the way they are arranged. So. Yeah. So it could have been a global civilization and it was the same civilization that we're seeing exhibited around the world because they had ships and they could cruise. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it sounds outrageous. It does. To most humans to, on the planet at this time, it sounds outrageous. It sounds outrageous that, you know, you would have a civilization that had gravity control, that had ships that could go around the world like 12,000 years ago. However... You know, from the result of the evidence, there's not 20 million different conclusions you can come to. And the evidence is overwhelming all around the world. And it really is time for the archaeology community to get with it um, and uh, stop hiding uh, and actually look at the evidence for real and stop repeating. If you're a student in archaeology and you're continuing to repeat, what it was said in the 30s and 40s um, it's really time for a different story um, because you know the evidence is overwhelming all around the world and so um, yeah it, it sounds outrageous of course however you know the latest sensor of our solar of, of our galaxy show that there is at least um, 40 billion planets in the Golden Knock region that is in the re inhabitable region of their star in our galaxy alone. Uh, so, you know, the idea that we're alone in the universe, the idea that, uh, you know, we're the most advanced civilization, that we have the most advanced knowledge, uh, and that there is nobody that has been able to come and visit us is maybe erroneous and fundamentally erroneous and the evidence points to the contrary and so you know although it might be hard to believe there's a lot of evidence for it there's a lot of evidence all around the world for it in ancient times uh, ancient temples that are left for us to ponder about but as well in modern times. So, you know, that's where we're at. And you look at the standard archeology span view and they say that these guys were moving these rocks up front, up and down the mountains. And, and we just hiked mm -hmm. and saw how hard it is to just even walk without carrying anything. Yeah, exactly. We just went up Montana, took us a few hours. It's grueling, um, you know, steep hike, um, you know, and to imagine that uh, people would like be going up and down like this, these mountains readily with thousands, millions of stones, 
uh, billions of tons of material would be very difficult. So, you know, it, it's not conceivable, it's not feasible, you know, and so, but if you have ships and uh, you are able to terraform the planet very easily, um, then you might, you know, terraform a region like this to cultivate for the world, you know, and be able to export because you have, just like we export today, uh, you know, using planes, but in this case, using technology that's a little more advanced. So you can, you know, terraform in altitude, you can, you know, make all these plateaus, you can move very large rocks from faraway quarries, across valleys, you know, build temples in very high altitude and so on. And yet you don't have any of the issues you would have if we were trying to do that today with our technology because you have gravity control. And it's really what's required to be able to explain uh, some of the evidence that's present, not only in Peru, of course, in Egypt, but in many other places, Baalbek, you know, many other places around the world. It demands this level of explanation. It demands breaking, you know, the preconceived ideas and actually coming up with something very much more, you know, feasible and for this time. And when you explained all this to the guides at Machu Picchu yesterday, mm -hmm. what was their reaction? In general, very, very positive. Um, even, you know, the archaeologists, because they've looked at it for a very long time and it doesn't make sense to them neither. You know, they look at it, they, you can clearly see the difference between megalithic, you know, incredible rocks, uh, position and, and arrangement and, you know, Inca repair. And so it's clearly a much different uh, uh, culture, a much different technique, you know, a much more um, uh, evolved, evolved way of building walls and uh, temples. And, you know, for them to think, you know, for, for them it was hard, although they're saying it every day, it's hard to swallow because it's like you got Inca stuff that is clearly, you know, manageable size, you know, put together like in, in dry stacks that like you would expect from civilization that are not so evolved. And then, you know, you, and then right beside it, you have stuff that we can reproduce with all of our technology today. And like the two just don't match. So when they, I started to talk to them about that, they start to go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, the Incas found this place and then repaired it the best they could with the material that was available in this region. And that, you know, starts to say something vastly different about our world. Jonathan on the feed is asking what kind of technology do you think that they would have had to be able to plasmify rock and, you know, move them with precision like that? Yeah, well, it's not obvious, you know. I mean, we don't have it today, otherwise we would be doing it, right? So, you know, we don't construct buildings with 30-ton boulders or 100-ton boulder or 200-ton boulder or in Egypt, like 1,000-ton boulder, right? We don't built anything using that kind of stuff because we don't have the technology to do that. But we're getting close to the understanding of physics that might lead us to this. And so speculatively, you could say that if you have a civilization that has learned to control gravity, right? So has learned to curve space time, has learned to uh, generate high energy fields in the structure of space time that they may be able to like create an energy level in a region of space so high that the composition of a stone would become like a cold plasma you know a, a very highly energized ionized state of that um, of that stone and it would have the consistency of like kind of like uh, 
marshmallow consistency or clay yeah consistency and and then you know but and it would be somewhat hot but not like in a place to, uh, in in a position like in, in a in a uh, magma configuration still you know something malleable and then the 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 energy level would make it levitate so you could place it where you want it and then mold it the way you want it and that might be why these knobs are there and definitely you can see it bulges so you know when you're placing one on top of the other they bulge because they're soft right and then you remove the energy level off this off off the stone and then they solidify the way they are and they almost fuse together one beside each other and you see that you see that over and over again you see as well the consistency of the rock being unusual that is you know we know approximately where these rocks came from and in these region the rocks have veins and they have all kinds of you know um, imperfections in them but when you actually uh, look at the ones that were used to build the walls you can see that they actually have you know a very homogeneous consistency you don't see huge veins crossing the boulders and so on they're almost like perfectly consistent and that may be because the molecules in the rocks were altered they flowed a little bit when they were highly ionized when they're in they were in a state of a cold plasma and uh what about the rocks that like the quarries at the top of the mountain like the, mm -hmm. the standard model says that they were just dragging them down from the top of the mountain and then into the valley and then back up again yeah so you know i mean these sites like in the sacred valley were like 50 to 60 ton boulders i mean those are huge people don't necessarily realize what that means how big that is and how difficult it is to move something that big and so on and to just say oh yeah and and then we and then the quarry for those places you know the quarry is literally across the valley you know another mountain top like it was quarried at the top of a mountain and so like to take a 50 ton boulder down the mountain across a valley across a river back up another mountain to go and build a building is not only not practical, but it's completely inconceivable uh, with today's technology. Never mind, you know, bronze tools and vine ropes. Um, you know, it just doesn't happen. It really doesn't. So, you know, it, all, you know, so it, it is difficult to swallow, but it really is clear evidence that there was something very powerful very advanced that was at play when these buildings were built and that it was certainly not inca people people or or dynastic egyptian that were you know dragging 200 ton boulders and and stacking them on top of each other and uh where where do you want to go next to what else what other sites are you looking forward to checking out well we're gonna go to uh rapa nui you know easter island we're gonna go to uh Chichen Itza. we're gonna go to uh, uh teotihuacan you know many sites so, there's so many sites you know uh all around the world india middle east i mean there's so much stuff to go and see so we have a lot to cover but as well uh you know we're gonna try to do some archaeology i mean we are doing some archaeology at the resident science foundation using laboratories in the u.s to do some you know carbon dating to look at some artifacts all around the world you know so we like we're building a case from direct observation but as well from testing and good science that's being done on uh, biological samples but as well artifacts and so on, and so on all around the world artifacts and biological samples there 
there are other plays that that don't work in the classical description and archaeology of the standard model and you know and there's more and more uh, emerging is like mounting evidence is remarkable and you can't really ignore it and it's been ignored I mean it's literally been swept under the carpet by archaeologists by by museums and so on and it's like put in the back you know on the back shelves and you know never looked at again because it just doesn't work well we're pulling that out you know um, the evidence is emerging from many different sources all around the world and uh, you know so the resident science foundation is not just about you know going around the world and experiencing those sites uh, in terms of the archaeology but it's as well doing testing and appropriate science to be able to see like exactly you know get the new story right so we're going to go to mexico next fall the third annual resonance academy delegate gathering yeah i'm not sure exactly when it's gonna be but mexico is definitely one of the destination that's coming right up with rapa nui and uh you know going to look at the evidence over there too which is emerging i mean not only is it you know these famous sites that we're at right now but is that you know he even here this was only found in 1911 i believe and there was villages right around it nobody knew this was up here just two years ago they found a new site right near uh uh, uh right near here you know on the other side of a of a mountain and you know so these sites in the jungle everywhere that are being discovered uh, in Mexico in you know in Bolivia in, I mean all over the place so you know we're gonna as well attempt to like take smaller groups on sites that are not so well known and that are more recently discovered uh, in Guatemala and so on as well as to see the stuff before it gets altered uh, by you know the different organizations that uh, you know conserve those sites which is a good thing but um, we're gonna do some of our own exploration I just want to let you know there's a lot of people saying really positive cool stuff on the feed and saying hello from all over the world <laughs> right on and wishing you well thank you and uh, uh, very insightful comments like cheerleading on so thank you everybody for watching uh, thank awesome you here here let me just show you some of our folks here hey say hey everybody <laughs> we're, we're cruising around yeah there's a bunch of us uh, there's 150 of us as a matter of fact here I'll go ahead. hey there's 150 of us around the world uh, thank you Jamie come with us to Mexico next year and to Rapa Nui in the spring yeah absolutely and like uh, and Maura thank you for organizing this is Maura she like worked tirelessly for a year to organize this mm -hmm. and it's and been lots fabulous more to come. they're gonna get better and better and better <laughs> yeah thanks so much Maura yeah and it makes a difference you know us going to these sites and making you know like with these groups and like you know going to the sites and bringing the energy in so that like we can uh, you know kind of connect with the energy connect the sites all of our you know we're there with our little resonating crystal bringing bring the energy up and bringing the uh, the different um, the different connections between the sites together right instead of of the separation that has been made because this is this is this culture this is this culture this is it's like no this is one culture this is one humanity and it's like us coming to together and unifying not just unified physics but unifying humanity pre-cataclysm pre-flood right like if there was a major cataclysm whether it was a comet or a meteor or a sun flare if there was a lot of ice it got flash vaporized and then the oceans rose three or four hundred feet in a matter of days or weeks yeah and this is in the culture of all these peoples uh, all around the world over 300 cultures described this and, and and none of the Inca culture said that they built this stuff uh, they always say that the Sun gods built this stuff and that they, they came upon it so the archaeologists are ignoring 
the which actual, is what the actual people said. Right. They say, oh, isn't that cute? They made up myths and legends about the sun, sun gods. gods. Right. And it's like, you guys, those were people. And you know, it's basically a bunch of white men that came in the 40s and, and 30s and came up with these theories and they wrote them down and they were famous archaeologists. So like all the rest, the archaeologists have been repeating the same thing over and over. And if you're trying to get a PhD in archaeology and you say anything else than what they said, uh, you get in trouble. Sounds exactly like physics. Yeah, same problem. <laughs> and that's not science. It really isn't. Science is not about repeating what the people pre previously said. Science is about like looking at the evidence and coming to your own conclusion about what really happened uh, over here. Right. I get hot under the collar because it's like remarkable that they call us irrational. And we're looking at the evidence and we're actually, you know, doing the math. And hard we're, data. Yeah, hard data. And it's like, wait, the math doesn't add up. You know, you don't put 2,300,000 stone in a perfect geometric structure, you know, with 100,000 slaves. It doesn't happen. That describes perfectly the relationship of the earth and the moon and yeah. the meter and the cubit and the kilometer and the mile and the nautical mile. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and, and it just goes on and on, you know, and that's exactly on the earth. You know, so that it bisects the Earth where there's the most land mass, and I mean, it just goes on. The and speed of light in air and in the vacuum, and in a vacuum, yeah, described I, in different ways. Phi, pi, Euler, you know, you know e, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. To all, all the representation you see, and you know, the techniques are completely incredible, unbelievable, and it, from here to Egypt to everywhere around the world I mean it's everywhere and it's very consistent that is you can see the same kind of techniques you can see the same kind of like uh, attention to details and the same kind of you know constants mathematical constants that are being repeated like clearly this was a global global effort. yeah global civilization that was wiped out by multiple catastrophes and then the waters rose and everybody wrote about the flood like yeah. hundreds of cultures wrote about the flood yeah and they, and they didn't just keep that in their in in their traditions like generation after generation after generation for thousands of years for no reason they were like trying to tell something to the people of the future what happened in the past like that there was these you know, sun gods, right, that came from the stars. I mean, like, this is exactly how they describe them. I mean, it's even in the Sumerian plates. If you want it to last more than a few hundred or thousand years, if you want it to last like a million years or something, you build it out of rock, because the rock is not going to change that much in millions of years. That's right. And you build it out of huge boulders. Might as well. Yeah, might as well. Because it's so easy to move them. Yeah, if you have gravity control. Yeah. But you ain't pulling on 40-ton boulders across valleys. You mean that some serious alpacas and like dinosaur alpacas? Yeah, right. Is that how they do? I don't know, but they weren't they weren't doing the job. I guarantee <laughs> they weren't doing the job. So it's like you know, it's time to get real, folks. It just is. It's time to get real. I know, like you know, it's it's what's in the books, but like the books are wrong, you know. And it, and if you're doing a PhD in archaeology, like come on, get real. And, you know, don't just go with the status quo. Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence and go and see it for yourself. And or then go us. from there. Or come with us. We'll show you the evidence. And now the physics backs up these stories because, as you'll see with the Sims equations and the papers that are coming out, that it is possible to get energy directly from the structure of space. Right. And when you do that, you have an unlimited amount of energy because that space is not just not empty it's completely filled with energy right at the Planck scale yeah and these stones they're made out of protons and neutrons and electrons and they have huge amount of energy you just gotta know how to tap into them so that you can rearrange them and it's it's ta like what we're calling matter is just a state of the space itself. When you realize that, and the equations are unequivocally, 
you know, precise about this. And they're the most precise predictions on Earth to this day, okay? And, it's, and it clearly tells you that matter is just a state of the space. It's, it's, it's plasma that cooled down. Right. And so you bring it back to plasma again. And right. it's like, oh, cool. Now I'm like 99.8% of the rest of the universe. Right. And you can do whatever you want now. Yeah, you can. And, 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 you, and you have enough energy in a centimeter cube of space, in the structure of space itself, to alter anything you want. Right? So it's not like you can imagine like, oh, my God, the amount of energy it would take to ionize or to plasmify a huge rock. Because the ener you're not like making the energy over there with a nuclear power plant or a hydroelectric plant. That's why you don't find tools. Right. You don't find factories. Yeah, yeah, Because exactly. you don't need tools. Right. The energy's in the space. You're not like, there's no wires coming out of your device. That's to, right. To do this job. You're producing the energy in the structure of the space itself. By creating a vortex. You're or extracting a... the energy that's already there. Right? By spinning the field. By spinning the field. By by structuring space where space was before unstructured, and so you can alter the space so that the matter starts behaving differently. You can alter the space. It's it's feasible from these equations that you can actually alter the space itself so that you can produce matter right out of the space and although that might sound like crazy we are already doing it even in the mainstream with like the dynamical casimir effect where we just oscillate the space fast enough and then photons come flying out you know right out of the vacuum where are those photons coming standard model guys like well that's the what's thing. their answer to that well how do they account for well, that's they the thing. They renormalized the vacuum density because they didn't like the ether because it was too magical. Mm, but right. it's like the data's there, the energy's there. Yeah, you actually, there's a great conference that was given in 2017 uh, about the heath ether by, by a Nobel Prize winner in oh, physics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a great conference um, that people should watch by uh, Wilczek. Wilczek. Probably one of the best physicists on the planet today. And he literally told us that we're children of the ether. I mean, it's and how did the, how did the and, a, uh, academic world take that? It's remarkable. I mean, this is a Nobel Prize winner, very well respected physicist that clearly says you can't have a theory of physics without the ether, without energy in the vacuum. Which is what and Einstein said as well. And they don't even like Einstein saying that. Like they kind of right, but they so so. In general, the conference has been ignored, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm just, I'm just puzzled. Why is it so hard for people to, to imagine that? I mean, there's electromagnetic waves everywhere in the space right now. You know, there's infrared, there's, there's ultraviolet, there's, there's radio waves, there's, you know, microwaves. You know, there's like all we this stuff. Cell tower up there. Thankfully, that's why we're on Facebook Live. Right, and I mean, and and basically. You know, the idea that the space is empty is like clearly incorrect. And it's not only not empty, it's almost infinitely full of electromagnetic fluctuations. So is it going to take a young PhD student like to be able to flip the paradigm by being able to write a paper on this stuff? Like, well, it, it, how does it? How do? We, how does the paradigm? You mean in show? archaeology or in physics? In physics. In physics, it's been very well. Difficult. It's the same with archaeology, there's right? A, there's a, I'm not gonna name names, <laughs> but there's a student in our in physics that was trying to write a PhD on my on my equations. On, on your my, work. On my work, and uh, there was an intervention that was done between these professors and his uh, family. Intervention. An intervention. <laughs> they grabbed him. They brought him in into a mental institution. What? Yeah. They uh, and and they drugged him for almost three weeks until he uh, agreed to sign a paper saying that he would never talk about my work and he would change is uh, optic on his PhD but to it, something But else. it's mathematical equations and the numbers are the numbers, right? And you can show these equations to a physicist and say, D show me the miscalculation. Where's the error? Right. Right? You, you can. And there's no error. 
No, in I, the math. Uh, well, you know, they, there's some errors in my earlier papers, but they, that's normal in physics. That, you know, you have they're not fundamental errors. You're not off by an order of magnitude. No, um, and, but but it's certainly in the re, in the uh, holographic mass solution, quantum gravity, and the holographic mass solution, and all the papers that follows, there is no errors. It's clean, you know. Top physicists in the world publish papers and have a little errors there and there. These papers are completely clean. Uh, we output the the mass, the proton, more precisely than any other theory on Earth. The electron, extremely precisely. All the table of elements. I mean, it's and and now we're publishing a paper applying these theory to the universal size, and we get the critical mass with the with the strong, uh, dark matter, dark energy, baryonic matter, the whole thing comes out, boom, just right, with the same equation for the, from the quantum to the universal side. It's just right. At every point of the stuff, it's just right. So yeah, I mean, the, the math is good, but the institution are terrified. Because, of course, like it would change all of the current paradigms of physics. You know, the standard model goes away. They've been looking for dark matter for decades. Right. And, and they spent a lot of money on that. Right. And they want return on their investment. Right, exactly. And they love to build, you know, devices that cause... All of a sudden, if there's no such thing as dark matter, and, you know... Because it was just the vacuum energy in the space itself? Right, because it's just the vacuum energy in a galaxy that's not being accounted for. So, of course, when they look at the matter in a galaxy... They're looking at the baryonic matter. They're looking at the baryonic matter, that is the normal matter we see, and they say, oh, wow, you know, the galaxy...
photoelectric effect that really kind of birthed quantum theory with Max Planck. That's what they gave him the Nobel for? And that's what they gave him the Nobel he Prize for. He didn't even for. get the Nobel for relativity. For no, no, absolutely not. Yeah, because that uh, was way too out there. That was way too out there. And But the thing is, is that, you know, after all this, he, he like that, you know, basically they use an interferometer and they tried to see if they could see the ether dragging behind the rotation of the Earth. But the assumption is that they would see that at such a small res resolution. That so like the shearing between protons that are black holes inside of atoms? Like frame dragging.